Chapter 8, Colette and the Argonauts. After devoting the morning and a good part of the afternoon to housework, Jenny, with Henry in tow, waltzed to the creek and invested some time hammering away on her raft that was taking shape again beneath the old oak tree. Progress since the accident was noticeable, and the agrarian apparatus was really starting to resemble something floatable. Three wide boards had been fastened to the bottom of the craft to prevent migration of the tree trunks forming the bottom of the craft. Lashings had been tightened on the crisscross layers of tree trunks, and a forked L-shaped stump had been secured to support a rudder that would extend backwards into the river. All that remained was to affix some three-sided crates to serve as seating. If she had not felt so languid, she would have slid her project into the creek that moment, anxious for a more successful test run than the earlier fiasco. About three o'clock, her body noticeably hot, sticky, and tired, Jenny raced home to don her swimming clothes. She quickly gathered two long fishing lines, a tin can, a pocket knife, and a garden fork. Accompanied by Henry, she set off for the river, deciding that combining the diversions of fishing and swimming might just relieve the heat. Arriving at the bank, she proceeded to have a good, messy time. The river was dropping off to lower summer levels, making it easier to harass the catfish. She dug down in the muddy shore for a few night crawlers, big black or brown creatures that were especially delicious, at least to her Piscean friends. Henry assisted by scooping mud all over his belly, yapping and barking at the bait as if it had personally cornered it. Having gathered two or three worms, she baited her lines, cast outward, dropping with a plop into the main stream and fastening them to a sturdy overhanging branch. Spying no immediate action, she squished downstream to her favorite swimming hole, grabbed one of the many dangling vines, and, testing it briefly, swung wildly into the soothing dark water. Henry jumped up and down on the embankment before finally throwing all caution to the wind and pommeling forward. Flopping loudly, he immediately stroked gallantly after Jenny. She swam to the dog and pushed him back to shore. After climbing out and assisting Henry, who remained on the shoreline waiting, she again swung out on the vine. She repeated the process a dozen times or more, diving and then climbing out again and again. She paused only to check the fish lines after an occasional nibble. Soon the Sandtown Dray rounded the bend and chugged upriver to its destination. The hissing engine and smoke flume was always an impressive and novel sight, frequently drawing onlookers to the shore. The captain saw her lines and shouted a teasing inquiry about the size of her catch. Jenny, sitting on a large tree branch dangling her brown legs on the water, calmly hauled up a line displaying a good-sized yellow trout, firmly hooked. The boat hands whistled admiration and jeered her now silenced critic. Unknown to Jenny, her three compatriots watched the passing barge from the opposite shore at the ferry, but were soon crossed over and racing downstream to the swimming spot. They had had a big time unloading crops, plantings, and groceries at both the general store and at home. Mrs. Favors had reminded Dewey that the churchyard needed tending, and the three had invested the early afternoon hours in pious service. But of course, they were not too tired to search for gold mines, and Lizzie now quite emotionally demanded their departure. Liz announced most decidedly, the man at the courthouse told us all about the engine agent who got rich just picking up the nuggets. I want to see this mine myself and get some real gold. Oh, don't be silly, Pinhead, Jenny stated automatically. Don't you think people have already picked up all the picking up that's going to be done around here, as far as gold is concerned? Maybe, but they might have missed one or two small ones, Liz answered back, disillusionment dawning in her piercing blue gaze. Do lots of people visit the mine, Jenny? Rady asked pensively. 
Lord, no, laughed Jenny. Not much to see, and folks is pretty much too busy around these parts to bother with tourist sites. Oh, but I still think it'd be fun to see, Rady replied. Yes, what's we've now, Liz again insisted. Well, it's up in the hills on the other side of my house, Jenny informed them, and you can still follow just the bare tracings of the old road that ran up there. I'll show it to you on the way home. Dewey grimaced. No gold mines for me today. I have to run these letters and church music out to Miss Diggs so she can study them up for choir practice tomorrow night. No doubt she'll have a few other chores lined up for me when I get there. True, the girl sighed as he shouldered a knapsack full of parcels and carted off down the river path. <clears throat> off went the girl's interest, too. The waves slapped gently at the shoreline and the sun dazzled the water with a spray of summer heat. Jenny, whistling as she pulled in her lines, prepared to head out. Rady looked timidly at the spunky catfish still playing feistily on the line. Fishing must be some fun, she commented. Not in that dress of yours it wouldn't be, grinned Jenny. I'm as fishy as fishy can be, and I still have to clean these three for supper tonight. Papa will downright glow this evening. Liz, as they trailed homeward, was full of herself. It was almost as if the excitement of the mine was bubbling out of her pores. Jenny led the way down a grassy track across the fields, pausing at home long enough to deposit the catch in a bucket of water. They pressed onward to the Carrollton Road, quickly crossing and climbing uphill on a narrow trail. On one side, clumps of blackberry patches blazed with red fruit amidst the canopy of pine trees that broke at rev regular intervals. Granite boulders stuck out of the ground on the other side, leading higher and higher into the hills. The occasional stone outcroppings were covered with pink and yellow flowering sage, young gum trees, and trailing paintbrush. The wild morning glory vine crawled freely along the forest floor. Dozens of closed petals winced under the baked afternoon air.